I will come you to our first series of our online classes and today we will start looking at, at atomic structure the structure of an atom now one thing that you notice is that uh, everything that you do in the chemistry you do with chemicals so if you talk about chemical structures you talk about compounds they are all formed from basically atoms so for you to be able to understand this concept, you need to understand what an atomic structure basically is. Now, what you get is that uh, the first part of the atomic structure will be a bit historical. So we'll look at uh, the historical background and the first individual to propose or to carry out an experiment with regards to an atom was a man called John Dalton. That was in 1808. In his experiment, he came up with one thing. He said, matter is made up of tiny spheres that are able to bounce perfectly, elastically, and they are basically called atom. And one of his key principles is that an atom is indivisible and indestructible. So it's the smallest or the tiniest part of matter that cannot be divided further or it cannot be destroyed. Then a compound is any substance that is formed by joining two atoms. So one key principle that we learn from Charles Darwin is that he created the foundation of modern chemistry as we understand it today. Then we go to another man by the name of Joseph John Thompson. That is nine. 1898, roughly around 100 years after John Dalton. Now, according to him, uh, his portrait was based on a plum pudding, which he says that uh, matter is formed of positively charged species and negatively charged species aligned in the similar way the raisins are aligned in pudding. So this is what you get. So a positive charge and a negative charge are aligned the way so the brown stuff inside there, or this small brown spots that you have pudding, and uh, yeah. so according to him, what he said is that uh, matter is actually made out of a negatively charged space. Then, contrary to what Dalton says, he says that then an atom can be divided further to give you subatomic particles that you normally call as electrons. So meaning an atom can be divided further to give you electrons. Then on a positively charged space, he only assumed but never performed any experiment to confirm the case. The only part that he confirmed is that matter is formed of negatively charged space. Then we go to the Rutherford experiment. Now Rutherford uh, conducted an experiment using a positively charged helium. Uh, source. Then you have a gold foil. Now this experiment is called a gold foil experiment. Now uh, the best way that you can compare a gold foil is the same like you have aluminium foil. So it's a foil made of aluminium. So this is a gold foil meaning it's a foil made of basically gold. And what you discover is that you have a positive charge here then it goes and hits the gold in there. Then a few things are observed. Some of the light or some of the particles go through unaffected, some of which get uh, scattered around, and some of it gets reflected. So what conclusion do we make from that? So the particles that went through unaffected, it meant they passed through an empty space. So they went through an empty space. And the particle that got refracted or that get uh, reflected, what it means is that it could have hit a particle with a similar charge. Then it bounced back. Then you remember, this helium stores is actually positively charged. So what it meant is that it hit a positive particle in there and it got reflected. So two things that we get from Rutherford. The first thing is that uh, you have a positively charged particle. The reason why it came back is because it got repelled with a positive charged particle. Then the light that went through, it tells us that there's actually space in an atom. Contrary to what Luther, I mean, to what Thompson was basically saying. Thompson was saying 
uh, positive charge and negative charge are scattered around the way resins are in pudding without space. But according to this experiment, it tells us that uh, there is actually space in an, an atom. So what you get is that an atom actually has a center which you normally call as a nucleus. So there is a small dense positive charge in the center of an atom called a nucleus. And that particle is actually positively uh, charged. Then besides that, there is also an empty space in an atom. So what you get is that you can have a nucleus, then you have an empty space, then you get an electron there. So now, this leads us to what you normally refer to as the Bose model. Now, it's a model because it is based on conclusion, uh, based on other people's experiment. Bose did not do any experiment, but he tried to extrapolate what was discovered uh, by the previous scientist. And according to him, one key factor that he came up about is that uh, electrons move like orbits. I mean, electrons in an atom will circulate around the nucleus the way orbit selects the, the planet. So what you get is that uh, the way planets circulate the sun, it's a similar way the orbitals circulate the, the nucleus. So what you get is that you have the positive charge in the center, then you have electrons, then electrons are circulating in an orbital or in an orbit manner. Then there is uh, a defined distance between a nucleus and an electron, and an electron will definitely reside in what you normally call as an energy level or an orbit. Then this is in line what uh, Lutherford was saying is that there is an empty so the distance between the nucleus and an electron is an empty space meaning there is nothing there so this leads us what you have is that you can have a nucleus there then you have electrons rotating around the nucleus the similar way planets rotate around the sun if you get uh, carbon as an example what you have is that you have in the center there's a nucleus then around the nucleus are basically electrons that you have there. Then each electron is at a certain distance from a nucleus. And within that distance, there is an empty space. That's what uh, Bohr's model talks about. So Bohr's model talks about specific energy levels, meaning electrons reside in specific energy levels. So from here, what do we get? An orbit or an energy level can accommodate a maximum number. The first energy level, so, okay, before we go to that, what uh, Bohr says is that you have, if you have a nucleus, then you have an orbit, an orbit, an orbit, an orbit, an orbit. So you can have one, two, three, four, five coming from the nucleus. Now, bear in mind that these are going around the nucleus. All these energy levels are going around the nucleus. Then the energy levels can be designated numbers. One, starting from the nucleus. Then the first energy level is the one that crosses the nucleus. Then two. So you have one, two, three, four, five. Then according to him, he says the first energy level can accommodate two electrons. The second energy level, eight electrons. The third energy level, eight electrons. And the fourth energy level, 18 electrons. Then we go to the wave model. Now, one key factor uh, in the wave model, it says that an electron moves in a wave-like fashion, meaning it is very difficult to determine its actual position or location. Since it moves in a form of a wave-like fashion, what it means is that it only forms what you normally call as an electron cloud. Then you notice that an electron cloud that is closest to the nucleus is normally called as the lowest energy level. 
and an electron cloud that is further away from the nucleus is normally called as the outermost energy level. Now, this is a language that you need to understand in chemistry. For example, if we talk about the lowest energy level, then you know it's an energy level that is the closest to the nucleus. And if we talk about the outermost energy level, it's one that is the furthest from the nucleus. And according to Webb's model, an electron will form a, an electron cloud because it's difficult to tell the actual position of that electron. And what we get is a structure that looks like this. So you have a nucleus in the center, and these dots here forming a cloud is a possibility where you would find an electron. And that possibility just gives you what you normally refer to as an electron cloud, because you can tell exactly where an electron is, but instead you see where it was passing. It's like you get a string, you hold it fixed on one hand, then you start swinging it around. Then when you, the faster you swing it, you will see that it will be forming a circular line, meaning you can't tell the actual position where the head of the string is, but you'll be able to see the line where the string is passing. It's the same fashion that you get for an electron. You can't tell its actual position, but you can tell where it could have passed, and that just leaves an electron crowd. So basically, with what we've looked at, what parameters do we understand? From what we've looked at, we now know that an atom has two regions, the nucleus in the center and the electron cloud about the center of the nucleus. So in the nucleus, there are two subatomic particles that we found. There is a proton and a neutron. A proton is positively charged and a neutron is negatively charged then both of them have one atomic mass unit for a proton, one atomic mass unit for a neutron. Then in the electron crowd are electrons. And the electrons is negatively charged with the mass of 1 divided by 1836 atomic mass units, which is just equivalent to zero. So, from what we've discussed from the historical background, this is the take-home message or what we established. Okay, now let's see if uh, from what we've spoken about, we're able to answer a few questions now. The question is, how do we know the number of protons in an atom? The answer is simple. The number of protons in an atom are just basically given by the atomic number. So, one thing that you know is that the atoms on the periodic table are arranged according to the atomic number. Then the atomic number is just basically the number of protons in an atom. For example, the atomic number of carbon is 6, which implies carbon has 6 protons. Then the atomic number or the proton number is what we use to identify an atom. Or it's more or less like a fingerprint. Any atom with six protons is basically a carbon. And the list goes on and on. Let's look at other subatomic particles. We have what you normally call as a mass number. The mass number is just the sum of protons and the neutrons. Because from the previous slide, we know this is one atomic mass unit, and this is also one atomic mass unit. Then the electrons the mass is equivalent to zero, so what it means, they do not have mass. Therefore, let's look at uh, this example. Now, the question is, how would you tell if you are given this, which one is atomic number and which one is the mass number? The answer is simple. In most cases, the smallest number is the atomic number and the largest number is basically the mass number. So in nuclide, you can have something like X, Z, and A. So this is atomic number. And this is mass number. Then this is a chemical symbol, right? So now one thing that you notice is that uh, based on what periodic table you are using, these parameters are normally exchanged. 
but how do you know which one is which? It's simple. The smallest number is always an atomic number. It doesn't matter whether it is at the bottom or it is at the top. And the largest number is the atomic number. It doesn't matter whether it is at the top or it is at the bottom. Then also one thing, based on what you looked at uh, when you started, you know that an atomic number will always have a decimal place. The reason being they have atomic, uh, I mean they have isotopic abundance. So they always give you um, a decimal place. So now how do we determine the number of protons and the number of uh, electrons from the this nuclear that has been given here? We know the smallest is the atomic number. So basically it is a number of protons. And the largest is a mass number, meaning it's a sum of the number of protons and the neutrons. Then if we know the number of protons, we can calculate the number of neutrons by just subtracting the atomic number minus, so the mass number minus atomic number, and it gives us number of neutrons in an atom. Then you note that electrons and protons are equal for every atom because an atom is basically electrically neutral isotopes now from the previous slide we say is an atomic number is what we use to identify an atom so if you have atoms of the same atomic number it means they are the same atoms for example uh, you can have carbon and carbon now note that this is carbon 12 and this is carbon 14 these two are isotopes in the sense that they have the same atomic number but different mass numbers so what identify what an atom is is the atomic number not the mass number the mass numbers might differ but the atomic number will be the same for example i can give you you have carbon 14 6 and you have nitrogen like this now, the mass number here is 14, and here it's 14. Now, this is an isotope of carbon-14, and this is nitrogen. But this is carbon because atomic number is 6, and this is nitrogen because atomic number is 7. Element number 7 is nitrogen, and element number 6 is carbon. So it doesn't matter the mass that you get there. So when you talk about isotopes, isotopes are atoms of the same atomic number but different mass numbers. That's why for carbon, you have... Carbon 12, which is 6, carbon 13, 6, carbon 14, 6. So all of these are isotopes because of the same atomic number, but they only differ in mass number. So in short, they have the same number of protons by different, so they have the same number of protons by different number of neutrons. And I think for this, I'll end here. And I'll see you in the next series of our lectures. Thank you.